Hello and welcome. My name is Janice B. Gordon, co-president of the Professional Speakers Association, PSA Southeast, and visiting fellow of Cranfield School of Management, consulting and training sales team in key account management. As a professional speaker, I talk about scaling your sales, but today I'm up close and personal with my friend, Jeremy Corner. Hello, Jeremy. Hi, Janice. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Let me introduce you first before we get into the, the questions. Blue Eyed Sun is an award winning, winning, <laughs> willing, winning <laughs> greetings card company specializing in homemade, high end, design led greetings cards. It's founded by Joe and Jeremy Corner in 2000, and the business now sells to the best um, in the business. Uh, it sells gifts, cards, um, and cards to card shops around the world and customers include Harrods, Paper Chase, uh, um, John Lewis, House of Fraser's, I mean it just goes on and on, really great, great brands that, that uh, Jeremy sells to. Um, so, you know, he's also considered to be a top influencer in his his field and you can often see him um out speaking ivy <laughs> ellen which is a wedding um stationeries specialist right. now he is an influencer and really passionate about people and cards and i'm lucky enough to actually receive cards um from jeremy but he's also really a master in uh, uh social media so you'll see him popping up um quite a lot on on twitter so again make sure you follow him uh he's like myself a sage business expert and a sage blogger but he also sits on gift association national committee and is treasurer for the greeting cards association so welcome jeremy Hi, Janice. Thanks for having me on. It's lovely to be here. Yeah, it's, it's good to grab you because I know that you've been traveling around the world quite a lot. So I, I feel quite honored um, that I'm able to get you uh, online. Um, oh, and I know that you were talking about you were just in Ireland recently um, with yeah. a, a supplier. Uh, with Tell my distributor, yeah. So, distributor. so we, um, yeah. So uh, uh, this is my distributor I've been working with in Ireland for the last five years. Uh, so I just popped over to see him uh, have a meeting, and catch up, and um, and do a bit of a brain swap with some of the th things that he's working on within his business. Uh, he he wasn't so strong on social media, so I was able to help him and his team uh, improve things there. And then uh, you know, I learned stuff from him about how he does his operational setup with his warehouse. So it's always good to kind of um, meet up with customers and suppliers to kind of, you know, find best practice and see how you can improve things with your business. So yeah, it was really, really, I was only there 24 hours, but it was really productive. So. Right. Excellent. I suppose actually your, your business, because you work so closely with a lot of your distributors, suppliers and customers, you're creating your own li little um, uh, community of experts within the field that you can yes. leverage from. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think people sometimes forget to do that as well. It's the same with our customers. You know, we can learn a lot from our customers in terms of the way they work and also what's important to them and, you know, and pick up tips. And I think it's um, it is good to it's kind of an obvious one, but it's good to get out there. We, we do a lot of trade shows. So I see all these people at shows, but actually going to see them in their own environment. There's just little little tiny bits and pieces that you pick up um, that you just don't see at a show. So um, and it gives you a better understanding of who they are and how they operate. So, yeah, it's, it's good to do if you can. <laughs> so I'd like to find a bit more about um, you, Jeremy. I know you're a cheeky chappy, um, but what's the one thing in your early life, <laughs> early life that you've always taken with you, um, besides humour? Um, the thing that's really created the biggest impact in your life. Uh, well, I was quite a shy boy until uh, I reached high school. Um, I was quite quiet, into playing with my Star Wars action figures and not really <laughs> doing much in the world. Um, but uh, one of the things that really stuck with me was when I was a teenager, I, my first job was working in a restaurant. I, um, I grew up in South Africa and I came back. I was, I was studying over here in the UK. So I think I was about 15. I came back uh, for my first holidays. And, um, and we used to go to a restaurant called Mike's Kitchen in South Africa. Any uh, one from South Africa who's watching this might recognize the name. And uh, we used to go there as a family lot. And my dad just said to the guy around it, hey, can you get my son a job for the summer? <laughs> I hadn't even asked him <laughs> for a job, but he obviously wanted to get rid of me. <laughs> and um, and yeah, that job really changed my life in a lot of ways, a lot of good ways. Uh, so the first night they had me washing dishes and I came back and uh, I said to my mom, you know, this, this job sucks. I'm better than this. 
and uh, and she said why don't you just stick it out for another couple of days see how you get on and and the next day pretty much they put me on tables uh, and I don't think they realized I was 18 at the time because I was I was serving <laughs> serving alcohol and <laughs> all the rest of it but I learned um, and I learned a lot about, so we had our own section with covers. So we had like, I had 20 covers in my section and it was my responsibility to get all the payments from them. I had a little bum bag with cash and from the bills. At the end of the night, I'd cash up. Uh, I'd give them the money that was left and what was left in my bag would be the float and any tips that I made. And the great thing about that job was you had commission on upselling things like onion rings and T-bone steaks and Toffee Don Pedro's. And so, so you even got, remember that now. I do. Toffee Don Pedro's are yummy. They're like you would like them. They're like a milkshake with with a toffee liqueur in them. <laughs> Just drink them all day. And um, uh, and so you know that really taught me about selling and uh, managing my own. I kind of in effect had a little mini business within the business. And and it also learned. It taught me how to become an expert in, in my products and to just to learn like little things like if you touch your customer on the shoulder and they've, they've done studies on this since. So if you touch them for a certain period of time, if it's too long, it's weird and creepy. If it's too short, it's similar. But if there's a, there's an optimal time that you can just put your hand on their shoulder and they feel more affinity with you and you know, you get bigger tips basically. And so little things like that and just knowing how to upsell, that was really easy because you just, it's like, you know, at uh, McDonald's they do it, don't they? Would you like fries with that? It was that kind of thing. And I just learned to say that. And so that's extended out into, into lots of things within my life in terms of interpersonal skills, but also like within, within our business. So whenever I'm at trade shows, I always, you know, I always ask for, uh, you know, I upsell basically without without it feeling like you're being sold to because you're basically just making sure that that person's aware that you do onion rings or that you do these extra products or whatever. It doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, and nine times out of ten, if you do make them aware, they you know they'll consider it and then perhaps they'll order. So so yeah, that that um that job really uh, changed my life. And I, I I worked hard all summer. And I made well the ran to the pan was terrible. So I came back to England with about six hundred quid. But you know, when you're fifteen, it felt, felt like yeah, a fortune. That's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I bought my first stereo with that. It was all in separates from uh, Richard Sounds in New York and uh, uh, yeah, I still have it to this day. So yeah, it was it, it, that 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 early childhood experience for me was I mean it's not a super early young one, but that one for me was one of my major things for getting into business. So I was always poo poo of business at school. I I thought, you know, I I'd never be a businessman. I, I I wanted to do more creative things, but I didn't realise how creative actually being in business uh, really is. So mm. yeah. Very much so. So tell us about the start of um Blue Eyed Sun. Uh so uh I didn't have any intentions to get into greeting cards, but uh, my girlfriend at the time, she realized that she couldn't work for anyone else. And, um, and so we made a list together. I, I, we sat down and made a list of all the things that she could do. Uh, and for a short time in York, uh, where we met, she, uh, had, uh, rented a shop because she'd taken on because it was only 30 quid a week, but it was kind of 30 quid a week for a reason because it was just <laughs> in the middle of nowhere and no one went there. Um, but in the time that she had the shop, she made these cards like at home to put on the back door, which is any space uh, on the front door on the back of it. Uh, she had a card rack and those were the, one of the best selling things in the shop. So she took those designs and made more. Um, we realized reading cards is a low cost of entry industry. Um, you know, we had a product that was quite different from anything else we'd seen around. Uh, and, you know, other things that were on that list were she could have been a painter or an interior designer or a wedding dressmaker. But to get going with all those things was going to take longer. Uh, and there's a lot of question marks as to whether you could sell, you know, 30 paintings a year at a thousand pound a pop. Whereas actually selling greeting cards was easier. So, so yeah, um, she put the first portfolio together. I helped her to do all the pricing and uh, do the order form and everything. And uh, yeah, I remember her getting her first order. She uh, we'd done a, a pricing plan where basically if the, the customer ordered everything it was like three hundred and fifty pounds. And and uh, she would go into shops and they'd say, no, we are good for cards. We don't want anything. And she said, well, can you just take a look and give me some feedback? Five minutes later, they'd ask her if she had an order form and uh, she'd take an order. So that first order, I remember they ticked that top box and, and, um, and yeah, so you, you never forget those first, first orders. And I didn't really have any intention of being in a business, but, um, and the first year was quite tricky. We only did about, she only did about 10,000 in sales and she made a small profit about 500 pounds. And, you know, you're constantly applying the money back in. Uh, but then, uh, in the second year, we, we went to a trade show to find sales agents because there's these people that, uh, are freelancers around the country that will go into shops every week with other card companies and gift companies or jewelry or what have you. And so if you had a relationship with one of them and paid them a commission, you know, you could suddenly do a load of sales in Scotland, which you couldn't do on your own. 
with someone who had already had those relationships. And so we went to the show to find two and we were approached by 16 and we went with six and overnight the business just, just mushroomed. Uh, and, and then sort of it just kept on going up and up and up um, over those years. Um, and, uh, until, until it's, um, you know, it became quite uh, unmanageable for us because was, we were working all the hours that God sent. So, um, yeah. uh, you know, but we can talk more about that uh, mm-hmm. in a bit. But, um, but yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's how we got started. Yeah, so I was actually going to ask you, what was the most challenging milestone in your business? Yeah, so, um, so in about 2003, so we started it in early 2000, and uh, I came on board sort of full time in 2001, late 2001. And uh, and by the time we got to sort of 2003, I, I, I went out to um, dinner with a friend. Some, uh, well, actually, I went to watch a basketball game. My, my friend of mine was coach, uh, was refereeing his first professional game. And uh, his dad was uh, there. We went and watched the game. We came back to the pub afterwards. And I, I called up Joan and said, do you want to join us? And she came down. And I went to the bar to get the drinks. And I came back, and she was in floods of tears. <laughs> and all that had happened is my friend's father had said, uh, you know, how's it going with the business? Um, and I think that was a real turning point for us because, you know, we just, it, we kind of become frogs in hot water. We were just loading on this kind of rapidly growing business and we were working super long hours. It was exhausting. We didn't really know why we were doing, we didn't have a sort of a goal, uh, a lifestyle goal or any financial goals. It, it just, it was, it was controlling us rather than us controlling it. And so it was quite fortunate because he was actually a, a uh, a personal development coach and so he did some coaching with us uh and we did this exercise called looking back from perfect which um i've spoken about at sage conferences and at uh, other events um and that essentially we set up the smart goal which i'm sure you and your uh, uh viewers will know you, you have a specific measurable achievable realistic and timely target uh which for us was to uh to half our working week in terms of our commitment to the company and to have the same amount of money and to do that within a year. And so we did this exercise. Uh, and then at the end of the year, we did actually manage to achieve that. Not only that, we actually doubled our income. So, and that, that completely transformed our lives because uh, it meant that uh, even to this day, um, you know, we've been able to run the business on our terms. It meant that we had to get comfortable with delegating to other people. You know, so often small businesses, you know, we, we want to control everything and we don't want to give anything up and we think, oh, no one's going to do it better than us and all those kind of, and that's, that's true to some extent, but actually, um, you know, forcing yourself to kind of get real about all of that um, has meant that we have been able to delegate. We've been able to build up a great team around us. So we, we've got, um, we've got a really good team of staff who, who run the business on a day to day basis. And then, uh, you know, we, we don't, we're not committed full time to business, which opens up, um, you know, our time to do other things as well, which means that the business doesn't, we don't, we don't feel like it owns our whole, whole life, which is, yeah. re- which is a really nice feeling. So, yeah. Well, I know that you're really active in the gift industry and we see you out speaking. So tell us what is the, do you see is the most valuable benefit of professional speaking? Well, as you can probably tell, I love speaking. <laughs> I love talking in general. Uh, and uh, so, so yeah, that's, <laughs> for me, it's just not the thing to talk. It's easy. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. um, I mean, I actually, I, I did, I remember when I was a boy, I did, uh, I did stand up and do a talk in front of a class and I was petrified because like I said, I was a shy boy and, um, and uh, the teacher loved it so much. He gave me the opportunity to do one in front of the whole school. And I, I bottled it uh, at the last minute and I just didn't have the courage to do it. And so, you know, a lot of people, they are kind of, uh, you know, fearful of speaking. And I think it, it is something that's great to overcome because once you get comfortable with it, it opens a lot of doors for you. And so, uh, and a lot of opportunities. Um, it also gives you credibility within your industry, um, you know, uh, and, and it gives you a lot of profile. So for me, I've had uh, huge PR benefits uh, from it. And it also um, just enables me to get my message about my products and also about things that I think can have a benefit in people's lives, like the looking back from perfect exercise. I, you know, I give talks and I share that that tool and how to use it. And um, and so. Yeah, I think I think profiles really good. And also I, I find it's really good for you personally to. So whenever I coach people or, or talk to them, I have to get very clear in my mind about, you know, what I'm saying and what matters and what's valuable. And once I get clear in my mind with, about that, I kind of take that back to my business. 
um, you know, and because I always, <laughs> I, I do a talk every year, this thing called the Ladder Club in the card industry, which is for new publishers coming in. It's usually in the autumn. Uh, and it's for anyone who's kind of thinking about getting into cards or publishing or uh, there's actually two days. One is the thinking about it, and the second day is kind of going up the ladder. So how to grow your business from 10,000 to 100,000 a year uh, and, and, and upwards. And uh, I always come back from that and I say to my team, okay, I've told everyone they need to do this, this and the other. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure we're doing it. Can I just check that we are? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and so that's really good for us because, uh, you know, it means that we're constantly keeping an eye on how we perform uh, and it just gives us benchmarks where we can kind of check in with ourselves and that. So, so yeah, lots of good reasons, profile and also um, keeping track of your own uh, progress. So, yeah. Excellent. There is, um, <clears throat> you're always pushing your, yourself and I know 2017, there was a fantastic project that you did, a year long commitment uh, and it was weekly greetings card project and yeah. you listeners can actually see it on and they must check it out on youtube because it's absolutely brilliant you can see Thank the work you. that went into it um so you went around the country visiting retailers and uh it, it helped to promote them and but i'm sure you saw lots of common problems as you you went around so what would uh, the biggest problem you see in um retail businesses now and how would you go about fixing it well, you know, it's no secret in the industry right now that retail has had a tough time of it in recent years, and that continues. Uh, you know, there's lots of pressures on retailers with uh, rates, particularly business rates. You know, that seriously needs reviewing, and, and we campaign through the Giftware Association and the Greeting Card Association to uh, and and you know try and make the government. Uh, take that on board and try and review this ancient system, which is probably not really fit for purpose in the same way anymore. Um, so uh, there are things that are within their control and things that uh, without their control. I mean, so they can campaign campaign against uh, things like rates and also against parking issues. A lot of small towns have issues with customers being able to park, um, and that obviously has a knock-on effect on the high street. So I saw a lot of things like that traveling around the country. Um, so yeah, if your viewers want to check it out, I'm sure you'll leave it in the footnotes, but it's youtube.com forward slash the greeting card project. Um, and yeah, so that was an interesting one as well, because I was sending, my, sending, I was buying and sell, sending other people's cards, so not just Blue White Sun cards. I think I only sent one Blue White Sun card the whole year out of about 250. Um, so it meant that I got to see, I got to see my business from a consumer perspective. Uh, and I got to see a lot of my retailers on site, which as I mentioned earlier, is super useful in terms you know, as, aside from seeing them at trade shows. Um, so one of the things that really surprised me with retailers was how few of them are active on the internet, like uh, not just with um, selling online, but also with um, social media. Uh, and for me, social media is such a powerful tool that it's kind of almost a no brainer and it's pretty much free. So I do meet, because I do the talks at the sh uh, trade shows and things like that, I do meet innovative retailers who are trying new things. And you know, these days you can put a product straight onto your Facebook page, you know, and people will buy it from there. You don't even need to have a, a website, um, yeah. an e-commerce e website. Um, but, you know, when I did those videos, every time I did one, I'm creating an effect to promo for those shops. And so, mm -hmm. you know, because you and I have been friends on social for a long time. And, you know, when you tag each other, then, you know, there's sharing and retweeting and, and you get a lot of leverage through re those relationships that you have on, online, right? And so, so I think retailers miss a trick with that because, you know, they can, you can learn a lot from social media, which is useful for growing your business and pick up loads of tips, but also you can just get your, you can get known uh, further, further afield. And so like, I'll give you a good example. There was one shop down in, um, in the South uh, East of England that I went to beautiful shop, like over a hundred years old. They kept all the original fixtures and fittings, just stunning looking when you went inside every, because it was an old chemist. A Victorian chemist so they had all these beautiful like handmade glass wooden cabinets just everywhere and you didn't matter what you put in them it just looked stunning right and so and it's got loads of heritage that shop so that shop really should be taking that heritage and sharing that online now they're in the south east of England which is not that far from Calais and not so and there are a ton of people right going from France over and back every summer and so in a way, if they were famous online with their beautiful shop, they could pull some of those people who they've arrived in the UK, they just want to stop and have lunch. It's not that far away. So they could just stop there, visit the local town. Not only would they benefit their own business, but they benefit the town. Now, if they got really smart with it, they get all their other businesses that are interesting in that town onto social media. And then suddenly you, you've got a real hub of, of energy and excitement and 
I think if you do it well uh, in uh, you know retailing online, you can just pull these people physically into your town. Um, and so, and and it can almost become like a tourist spot in itself just from sharing that story online. So I think if you've got a really great story as a retailer, like the shop in particular or, or other ones, uh, and you can um, you can share that online and through social media and through your website and through a blog or blogging, uh, you know, it's it's a huge opportunity for retailers. I think a lot of them are missing. In the PSA, we we talk a lot about storytelling and having your story. So I think not just retailers but individuals entrepreneurs yeah. story is so important it's not only the telling of it but actually formulating your story yeah. um, to share with other people and that's one thing that people always engage with do you, would yeah. you say that's true yeah i think so you know it's it's a bit of a scary one isn't it i mean not for you and i because <laughs> we're chat <laughs> love to talk <laughs> <laughs> we love to talk um but but no actually it is i mean it has taken i've had to uh, come up my shell as the years have gone by on social and get comfortable with that idea of being online now like you know we're doing this video and i might say something stupid and it's online now <laughs> so you have to get comfortable with that right and you yeah. have just and, and actually you know being vulnerable online brené brown talks about it the power of it and um you know i think actually just even stepping up and 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 you know being prepared to do these things puts you in a stronger position personally because it gives your confidence uh and then also um people can um can relate to you in some way so you know now i have it like because of all the online work and i'm sure you probably have it where you go to events and you might because we've got friends that we, we IRL, they call it in real life and, uh, and digital friends. Right. And so I have digital friends that I still haven't met in real life yet, but um, yeah. I've had it where I, like uh, we have a mutual friend, Simon Barry. And I remember the first time I met him uh, in real life and we, we hugged each other and we, we, we'd known each other, you know, cause yeah. we kind of felt like we knew each other. And so, so yeah, I think, I think shops do miss a trick with this and, and businesses miss a trick in terms of the personal uh, profiles as well. Like, so putting themselves out there in that way, um, you know, uh, and, and we, a lot of people in the, I think in England find it tough to network. So it's kind of like putting that online and doing it in person, but you just got to start in small steps. You don't have to go to networking. Some people are really hot in networking. They go to a networking event and meet 30 people at the event. But even if you go along and just meet one or two, that's, um, you'll find that it'll take you places that, you, you hadn't thought of before and i think that's um that's really important because it helps you to grow and can help grow your business i don't remember you hugging me when you met me you're <laughs> hugging simon you're not we hugging me. each other didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i mean it's true yeah. that people still have a lot of fear around uh social media and especially with all of this with cambridge analytics and uh uh facebook um you know, people are reluctant to uh, be vulnerable online but actually i leave in all of the glitches all of those you know little things that's the thing that makes you human we're not robots and you don't actually being perfect all the corporate videos and stuff that gets out is not the thing that engages people it's the individuals within the companies the character the you know yes. the quirky things they're the things that engage people um and the mistakes as as, as well and then that's know. the thing that you need to show to be human do you, do you yeah. think so definitely i mean you know the mistakes are uh, so i studied film at university uh, and um and there's a guy called andre bazin who was a theorist theorist on film and he so he talked about uh, the relationship between the perceived reality uh, you know, when you watch a film, he said, like, you know, if you're filming an avalanche, the camera should get hit by the avalanche as it's coming down the hill, because that looks more real than if you've just got a really slick shot of an avalanche going down. It feels like you're more there. And I think that kind of that kind of theory extends out to to, you know, doing video on social media like this, uh, you know, and um, uh, and having a kind of, yeah, just having a sort of warts and all kind of approach but um but i have put my makeup on this morning so yeah so by bit of lippy. <laughs> <laughs> the showing up and so, the showing and up either side that. of this frame that you see is just a mess <laughs> complete mess so i'm not gonna <laughs> you've got your washing out <laughs> that's right washing oh god i'm not even going to tell you what's on this side but it's bad <laughs> <laughs> I told you not to talk. Right, Jeremy, we must move on. <laughs> this is what we're like. Okay, so I want to say congratulations on uh, winning the Queen's Award for International Trade. Thank so you. tell us how you started trading internationally, because this is a real fear for a lot of, of people in business. Yeah, I mean, I think, and it was for us too. Uh, and I, I would say, you know, I, I speak, so I speak with the Department for International Trade at events about this. And, um, 
And actually, there are some online talks that I've done which give you a lot more detail. So I can send you the links and you can share them if you want with the, underneath this video. Um, so uh, the, the first thing is to make sure that you're really good in your, in your current market. And by good, I mean like um, operationally, you're set up to be able to handle lots of orders. Uh, you can handle them quickly uh, without any problems and you've got good cash flow. So um, uh, because once you start selling abroad, especially if you work dist with distributors uh, and you're selling products abroad, um, you you, you're not going to make as much margin on those. So, and you may well have 60 day terms with them or even 90 day terms. So uh, if you've got all that going, that really drains your cash. So you have to be set up well with ca good cash flow. You have to be set up well with being good operations because you don't want to suddenly, because the volumes internationally are bigger as well. So you don't want to start selling abroad and then find that you can't handle your, your business at home, which can be de devastating if you get that wrong. Um, and then, uh, and then also operationally, you need to have someone on your, on your team who can help you handle uh, the, the, all the paperwork because there is paperwork selling to the EU and selling to countries around the world. It's, I, I hate form filling, but I've got a really uh, great woman on my team called Rachel and she's a wizard. At, and and um, so, you know, we, we hired her specifically to help us when we started expanding. So in answer to your question, we turned down a lot of international approaches to start with um, and we dabbled a little bit and we found it really hard and we couldn't get it right. And then when we had to make a plan to actually gear ourselves up to do it properly. And so our plan was to grow into three countries a year for, for five years. Um, and we ended up doing four countries a year uh, and, and it grew really well. Uh, and, and we got support from the Department for International Trade, which was called UKTI back then. Uh, and they helped us to, we, we found a lot of our distributors through trade shows, but um, we also got some, uh, just some help and advice about how best to handle them. And also a list from them of other potential distributors that we hadn't met in countries that we were interested in. Um, and so that was all really good. And we, we didn't actually even plan to enter those awards, but the guy from uh, DIT, uh, our, our sort of consultant there, Abe, he, he said, look, you guys have done really well, you should enter this. Um, and and that, by the time I'd filled the forms in, I was, <laughs> as I said, I don't like forms. And uh, I, I felt like I should win an award just for getting the forms. Yes, just for filling the form. <laughs> right. So I was glad when we won, because uh, you, you have to, it took me a couple of days, and, and also that we had to get audited by our accountant, that you know, cost us money and stuff. But, uh, you know, I really really wanted to meet the Queen. I uh, thought it'd be super fun. And I was really glad uh, when we won because um, it was a great accolade for our business. And when they came and presented, it wasn't the Queen who came to us to present. We had one of her her, um, uh, her um, delegates. She came out. And when they read out the thing from it, it's pretty incredible. So, you know, just to, and to join all these prestigious companies, and we're tiny compared with some of the amazing businesses, I mean, much bigger businesses than us that win it. So, yeah, it's a real honor. And, um, yeah, and it was really good fun visiting Buckingham Palace, and and we met the Queen in her ninetieth birthday as well. So uh, I gave her a card, which um, she yeah. really liked. So, yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> next it will be Sir Jeremy Corner, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just remember me. <laughs> I'll remember. Yeah. All right, we've got to talk about this because you know you're always looking for new opportunities, and so you're currently diversifying into eco-friendly products yeah. with an exclusive deal with a Bamboo Cup and Bamboo Friends products in the UK and Ireland. So tell me a bit more about this because I know uh, it's really new. Yeah, it's new. It's really exciting. I mean, uh, you know, it's such a hot topic right now. All the single-use plastic. So, so in the UK, we put two and a half billion. That's billion with a B in uh, cups, uh, single use plastic lined cups into landfill every year. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're all doing, a, but we've done an amazing job with plastic bags. We've reduced them by 90%, you know, at the supermarkets with this 5P charge. And so, you know, trying to slow down on the number of straws we use on, you know, the plastic bags at the supermarkets and the plastic lined coffee cups is, is really important um, for us all. I mean, there's, I mean, that's just in the UK, that two and a half billion figure. So you can imagine it's much, much larger globally. Uh, and so these products that we've, uh, so our German distributor sells these cups in Germany and he, we've been looking to import something of his for a while now, uh, but I wanted the right product. And I'm always wary about diversifying out from what we do because you know we have our circle of competence uh, but i just felt like it's such a good time i really believe in the product so um and, the, and they're really nice so they're they're made from bamboo um and uh and 
they are they're really beautiful designs and they're obviously they're designed to be reused so um and we also have some lunch boxes and some kitties um uh, kind of tableware as well and so that launches with us it's just we've launched in the uk with the shops uh because we've got two and a half thousand retailers on our books so um you know we've been uh selling into them uh the retailers are super excited about that i don't know if you saw the news this week but waitress are now dropping all their uh, single-use uh, cups yeah. uh, and um, you know shops like Pret a Manger are giving discounts to people who bring in their own cups uh, and I think so is Starbucks um, so it's a really uh, the time's really right for it and um, the designs are good I'm slightly nervous about it because like I said it's um it's a different business for us the margins are different to what we're used to with greeting cards so we have to we, we've made sure we're set up with the cash flow well um, and we've got good warehouse space uh, and all the rest of it so operationally we, we're kind of geared up for it um, yeah and we'll see hopefully uh, it will be an exciting story in a year's time um, I'll um, I'll be able to chat with you again and, and say it's been a real success um but so uh, if anyone's interested at the moment you can follow us on social media at bamboo cup dot uk uh, bamboo cup uk it is so that's on instagram twitter and facebook bamboo cup uk uh where the website's being put together for consumers at the moment we'll be selling uh, to consumers from june so yeah yeah. All right, I'll put something else out um, when we post this um, on YouTube and all over social media. But it's, it seems like it's an area that I know you and I know you're really passionate about the environment. And so it seems that it's well aligned, but it must feel really good. That feeling of being terrified, but excited as, as well. You know, you, you probably had that at times growing the business and now it's kind of it's mulling over. You're probably looking for some of that feeling again. So it must be really interesting yeah it is i think you know uh, this year in particular and actually last year with the greeting card project because i you know as much as i do speaking and i do social media and stuff it's a different ball game making videos every week and putting yourself out there and you know um and so uh so but i've got this thing at the moment that i'm trying to do where when i feel fear i go straight to it and so rather than kind of hide from it and so uh so this year i i, I um I've just come back from the Philippines seeing my sister who had her birthday and she invited me over and um, uh, and and I scuba dived uh, for the first time. So I was a little Ooh. bit petrified <laughs> of doing that, you know, yeah. <laughs> grew up watching Jaws and so, but it, I really loved it. It was, um, I, and I even ended up doing a night dive, which I thought I would never do. Um, and I also, uh, I'm doing a trip across the Gobi Desert this year with uh, friends. It's an off-road motorbike trip. So the the last time I got on a motorbike was 20 years ago, and I, I crashed it within 20 minutes of getting on it and ended up having to drive <laughs> You were much up. younger then, though. I know. But also, it didn't help that I hadn't actually learned how to ride one. Um, okay. And so, <laughs> so I cut myself up, and I had to drive myself to a hospital on the bike and crashed two more times on the way <laughs> <laughs> so I never got back on a motorbike and I, I kind of had this I think I never let the fear own me through that time but I definitely had a fear for it and so when my friend uh, offered me this uh, opportunity to go on this trip with him and his mates um, uh, to the Gobi this summer I always wanted to go to Mongolia and I thought you know this is I don't know if I, want, I can do a motorbike can I do that and then I just thought well you know just move towards it take small steps and I, I booked in to get uh, lessons and I got my license about three weeks ago and and um yeah and it's exciting so i think you know the bamboo cup project is similar to all of that and i think actually what happens when you move towards fear uh, uh repeatedly repeatedly um when something fearful comes up for you you start to feel a little more excitement and they do say apparently that the that the, the emotions that go on within you of fear and excitement they're actually the same emotions it's just the way your mind is reading them and yeah. so and so actually the things that scare me now actually excite me a little bit and that's not in a daredevil kind of foolhardy way because i'm still very like my goal with go the gobi is just to get there and do it safely and enjoy it and so and i don't i'm not, I'm not a thrill seeker in the sense of like you know god I, re I really want to ride a motorbike fast or anything like that i just i think it's good to stretch yourself and and um and then bamboo cups the same for that so um but uh, I think it's what's most exciting about that particular product is is the moment really is now, and uh, and so to have uh, to be working with a product that's that's super hot, uh, you know, it's um, uh, it's going to be an exciting uh, twelve to eighteen months, I think. Yeah. And I, as entrepreneurs, we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. But it's quite interesting when I um, mentor people. 
we often play safe, don't we? We go yeah. into it because we want to be uncomfortable and we want to challenge ourselves. And then we get to a point where we want to be safe. It's like, yeah. hang on a moment, you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> this is not you. So yes. often we do need to nudge ourselves or other people around yeah. us kind of nudge us out of, out of that. Um, cause it's easily done. So I, I think, you know, we're, we're out of time, unfortunately, but you know, oh. you and I, we could go on for hours. <laughs> you have you noticed yeah. that I've kept quiet? You have. I'm <laughs> amazed. <laughs> this amazed. Is not like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you but you did talk. say the time is now, and I think that's a great way to to um, end it. So thank you so much for your insight and knowledge. It's always a pleasure, Jeremy. I miss you a lot. I haven't seen you for ages. This is I why know, I have I to get you online. <laughs> <laughs> we must meet up. We'll do it soon. We'll do it yeah, soon definitely. All right. Take care. See you soon. Bye. Bye.